Good morning. We're in lesson 19 of the Gospel of Mark. Today we're going to pick up in the second half of chapter 14. Last week we were dealing with the Last Supper and Jesus' institution of the Lord's Supper and a lot of different things that went on in that conversation. And that's where we're going to pick up today. So let's take a look uh, at uh, verse uh, 26. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus now lays a bomb on them. They're not expecting this. He says, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if I fall away, if all fall away, I will not. Isn't it interesting how people, when they hear themselves mentioned in a, in a speech or, a, or some kind of a public uh, forum or whatever, they immediately start thinking about how they're going to respond, whether that's positive or negative or whatever. Kind of their brain disconnects on what's said after that. Jesus is quoting a prophecy. He even says it's written, it's a prophecy, that you're all going to fall away. The sheep are going to be scattered. And then he adds something that's good. He says, after I have risen, he's been trying to convince them and explain to them that he's going to die and be raised from the dead for quite a while now. He says, I'll go ahead of you into Galilee. Ahead of you, meaning he's going to connect back up with them. But Peter doesn't hear any of that. Peter just says, fall away. No, I'm not going to fall away. I'm with you to the bitter end if I have to be. See how he says it. But then Jesus replies to him, and I, I, you know, Jesus, we've seen Jesus get angry with him. We've seen him frustrated with him. We've seen him roll his eyes. I believe this time Jesus is not that way. I think he's compassionate with him. He knows what they're about to go through because he knows what he's about to go through and how that's going to impact them. And he says, truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all of the others said the same thing. Now I'd like to go back and look at this prophecy. Uh, he says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. It's important because it's a major messianic prophecy. Zechariah is part of a pair of prophets that were sent in the time of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, uh, Haggai and Zechariah were sent because the people had gone and they had started building a temple. They had built the walls. They had started building the temple. And they come back and they didn't finish it. They just didn't finish it. And so these two prophets are sent to say, why are you not building? You're building houses for yourselves, but you're not building them for me. And these two prophets are also very, very much messianic uh, prophecies. And so let's see what they actually said and see how that ends up being this prophecy that Jesus is talking about. On that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile. They will consume all the surrounding peoples right and left. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, they will mourn for him as one uh, for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day a fountain will be opened in the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem uh, to cleanse them from sin and impurity. This is a clear messianic prophecy. This is one of those prophecies that the people really liked because what it said was Jesus is going to come, not Jesus, but the Messiah is going to come and destroy all those people that are attacking Jerusalem. This is the one we're going to get rid of all their enemies. This is why they think the Messiah is going to come and take care of Rome. There's some interesting things in there. He says, a spirit of grace, one that they have pierced, only child, firstborn son. I don't know that they really knew what that meant, although I think they're thinking that that is referencing Israel itself as the firstborn son, as the only child of God. But that's not what he's talking about. He talks about a fountain will be opened in the house of David. That reminds me of Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And he says, from inside you will flow rivers of living water. That's we're talking about the Holy Spirit. All of these are prophecies that they knew about. And they liked because it said the things that they wanted to hear. 
But then it's followed up in the next chapter with awake sword against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. This is what Jesus is quoting. And I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one third will be left in it. This third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call my name and I will answer them and I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. If Peter had had the sense to stop talking and start listening, Jesus might have explained the rest of the story. Meaning, Peter, you're part of the one third. He says, I'm telling you, you are silver and gold to me. Yes, you are going to be refined by fire so that you are pure silver and pure full gold. Why? Because I got a job for you to do. But Peter can't do that. He's got to keep on talking. He doesn't listen to what Jesus is saying. So then it just stops and they leave it. We'll pick it up later in the chapter. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. I think it's interesting that he takes Peter, James, and John with him again. He's done this before, took them to the Mount of Transfiguration. But I think maybe, as some other uh, commentators have said, that he did this for a little bit different reason this time. Peter has just said, I'm with you to the bitter end. And we know he's not going to even be able to stay awake much longer. James and John, not very long before, their mother has come and said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, I want you to put my sons, James and John, at your left and right hands. That's a time when Jesus said about drinking the cup that he drinks and being baptized with the baptism that he's going to be baptized with. And they didn't understand what that meant. Jesus is now talking about just how bad it is. Look at who he's talking to. It says, he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He says to the apostles. You know, think about what they're seeing. They've never seen Jesus like this, ever. Jesus has done confrontations with the scribes and the Pharisees. They've asked Him questions. They've never been able to trap Him. He's cast out demons. He's cast out thousands of demons at one time and over time. He's sat in the back of a boat sleeping while they were in the middle of an awful storm. Nothing rattles Jesus. And here He is this night. They don't understand it. But here He is this night, deeply distressed and troubled. And he says, stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Now, I want to pay attention to this prayer because in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, that this prayer is taken out of context sometimes and we don't fully understand what Jesus is saying or what God is saying. Jesus is saying, if it's possible, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And then he says, Abba, Father. I like that. Abba is kind of the name, not quite as, as familiar as, as Daddy, but it's a very personal name. It's, it's the Aramaic for, for my father, my personal my father. My grandchildren call me granddaddy, granddaddy. So when they say, Granddaddy, come look at this, or Granddaddy, we want to show you something, that's a, that's a term of endearment because they want to show somebody that they love something that makes them proud or something that they're interested in or something that they've done that's really well. And then he also says, he says, Abba, Father. He says, Abba, one that I love, and Father, one that I respect. More of the respectful word for it. And then he says, everything is possible with you. Take this cup from me. And then he says, yet not what I will, but what you will. My favorite commentator, the commentator that I use uh, heavily uh, for, this, uh, for this study, uh, both of them actually, one of them says it explicitly and the other one kind of implies it, says the father says to him, no. Now you know what? I don't think he does. I don't think in this context God is saying no to Jesus. 
I think the conversation is deeper than that, and we're going to see a couple of pieces of that as we move forward and compare it to another passage of Scripture, actually two more passages of Scripture. So hold on to that thought for a minute. I'll try to clarify it in a little bit, see whether you agree or disagree with me. It's okay either way. But he says, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he says to Peter. I love the fact that he uses his name Simon. Jesus calls him Peter. He doesn't call him Simon. He hasn't called him Simon since he gave him the name Peter. Why does he call him Simon now? Simon has been going back to his old ways. Simon has never listened. He's never understood. He won't pay attention to what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is saying, man, I've got a job for you to do. Your job is going to be fishers of men. And you can't do your job if you can't pay attention to what's going on around you. Because tonight's the night, man. What's getting ready to happen tonight over the course of this night and over the next couple of days are crucial to you being able to do the job I've got for you. It's crucial for you being that gold and silver as the prophecy in Zechariah says you're going to be. He looks up and he says, Are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? I thought you were going to go all the way to death with me, but you can't even stay awake when I ask you to stay and watch. He says, Watch and pray. He says, You pray as well as me praying so that you will not fall into temptation. Times of trial are major opportunities for temptation to take hold and to get seated in us. And this is going to be about as much temptation and trial as Peter has ever experienced, as well as the other ten apostles. And then he says something that I think has a dual meaning. He says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, I think Mark is repeating this, these words of Jesus because I think they have to do with what Jesus has just said to the Father as well as what Jesus is now saying to Peter. He says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is is weak. Do you think Jesus' spirit was weak? I don't. We've seen the spirit in Jesus from the moment of his baptism act in mighty power all the way through and he's going to continue on. But Jesus has also had to deal with fleshly concerns. We know that Jesus was tempted in all ways like as we are. Temptations are not something that Jesus just blew right through. It's not a temptation if it doesn't bother you. So the temptations had to bother him. Did he give in to them? No, I do not believe he did. Because his spirit overcame the fleshly temptation. Temptations are fleshly. Not doing the will of the Father is a fleshly temptation, not a spiritual temptation. I think Jesus is dealing with the flesh when he says, take this cup from me, not the Spirit. He's reciting that back to Peter when he says, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You, Peter, your flesh is weak. You can't even stay awake. Your spirit wants to do it, but you can't. And then once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. They're embarrassed. Two times now Jesus has prayed. He comes back and they're sleeping. Returning to him a third time, implying that Jesus has now left, gone and prayed a third time and comes back, he says to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Basically he's saying, you got time for rest other times. Tonight is an important night. And then he says, it's enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So now we're moving from, from the prayer into the next scene. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him uh, was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged as a signal with them, the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. I like the way Mark does it. Mark says, Judas was one of the twelve. And then it says, the betrayer was here and had arranged a signal. And that signal was a kiss of Jesus on the cheek. And then it says, and Judas kissed Jesus on the cheek. He doesn't say, Judas is the betrayer, like he did when he introduced all the apostles earlier. 
But now he's telling you, on this day, at this time, Judas is the one that has betrayed Jesus. Now, an interesting thing happens right after this. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. We'll be back to that in just a second. And then it adds an interesting passage. It's only in the book of Mark. It says, A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Scholars think this is Mark. No one else was there. There's no other reference to it in any of the other Gospels. Mark probably, if he was the one here, is putting this saying, I was there. I fled just like everybody else. I was one of the sheep. I was one of the sheep. This isn't a positive event for Mark. It's not one of the high points in his life. But now look at back to that previous passage. There's, there's one of the apostles. It says, interesting, doesn't even call him one of the apostles or disciples. Mark won't even give him that credit. It just says one of those standing near. Other people say one of those with Jesus. Drew his, his sword and cut off the uh, high priest's uh, servant's ear. And Jesus says, I, I'm not leading a rebellion here. There's no need for swords and fights and things like that. And he says, we're doing this. We've got to do this because Scripture's got to be fulfilled. Now, that's not the way it's recorded in the book of Matthew, although it records this same event. Let's look at Matthew for a second. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Look at this. This is the passage I want you to think about. Do you think I cannot call on my Father and He will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Now how does that mesh with Jesus' prayer just a few minutes before if it is that Jesus says, I want this to go away from me and Father, you do it, but you know what? Even though I want it to go away, I'm going to do what you want and like the commentator I mentioned said, God's answer was, no, I'm not taking it away. Now, there's a dilemma here. Because either Jesus is lying, or he doesn't understand what God's going to do, or he thinks he'd ask God and God would send it, but God's going to say no anyway. I don't think any of that's true. I think Jesus knew exactly what God was going to do. I think Jesus says, if, God, if Jesus says God would send him the angels, God would send him the angels. So how do we reconcile this? First, we go back to the flesh. In my mind, this is my mind, just my thoughts. Do whatever you want to with them. In my mind, it goes back to the flesh. Jesus is dealing with the struggle between the spirit and the flesh. This is the struggle that we deal with every single day. That's why this is so important. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 7. He says, that which I want to do, I don't do. That which I don't want to do, man, that's what I do. Who will deliver me from this wretched body, this wretched man that I am? He says, Jesus Christ. And that's followed up with, you've got two choices. The law of the spirit of life in Christ or the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ or the law of sin and death. You see, all of these things come together when you realize that God doesn't ask us to do something against our will. You go, huh? He just asked Jesus to. No, He didn't. He wants Jesus' will conformed with His will. What Jesus had to deal with in the garden was the problem of sin, His flesh and His spirit warring with each other. The same way Paul talks about our flesh and our spirit wars with each other. And the spirit must win. The difference is, in my life, all too often, I let the flesh win. 
That's when I give in to temptation. That's why we have to be watchful and diligent. That's why the Lord's Prayer and what Jesus just told the disciples, He prays that Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not arbitrarily followed as a sequence of commands that we do because God laid them out. Because guess what? We won't do that. Read the Old Testament. If you're reading with me, in, in the readings we've done, we just finished reading through the Old Testament, constantly they failed. They failed. God laid out all these laws. Couldn't keep them. Couldn't keep them. Got to do something else. Now, before we leave this, I want to give you one more little idea. In the Old Testament, it gives you some interesting things. Uh, the guy Bezalel, there's a guy Bezalel uh, in uh, Exodus that is a artisan in gold. And God says to Moses, go get Bezalel to build the Ark of the Covenant and all the things that are gold that are going to be in the tabernacle. And he says, and I'm going to put my spirit on him to do this work. So he's already an artisan, but God's going to put his spirit on him so he does it his way, the way he wants him to. God says, I want him to do it, and I'm going to give him everything that he needs in order to do that. Now, Saul, similarly, Saul, when he is anointed king, Samuel says, now go do anything that your hands find to do because God's going to be with you. In other words, Saul's will will be conformed with God's will and God is going to support him in what he does. And if you remember as we were reading through that, we saw that early on when Saul did things, he was quite successful at it. Because God was with him. And then Saul let go of God's will and started taking on his own will and God pulled his spirit from him. Now in the Old Testament, we see the spirit being given selectively to individuals that needed it. And you see the kings and you see, need, see selected individuals like Moses. The prophets had God's spirit on them. But what is unique about the New Testament is that the Spirit is something that is given to every Christian. Why? Because God wants our spirit conformed with His Spirit. So our will becomes conformed with His will so that His will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. By us. Not because we're following some set of prescribed rules but because our desire is the exact same thing as God's desire, and He will share that with us. I hope that makes some sense to you. Otherwise, this passage right here in Matthew makes no sense whatsoever. Okay, let's keep on going. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one more thing I want to point out, and I've got a passage here and I forgot to do it. And that is Jesus himself says this in John. In John chapter 10, one of the I am's of Jesus is I am the good shepherd. And Jesus says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of, uh, not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay down my, own, my life of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I receive from my Father. I want you to not get caught up in the word command again. But you see, Jesus says that no one can take my life from me. I will lay it down. I will take it back up. And he says, this is a command I got from the Father. The Father's will and Jesus' will are in sync. Even though on the night of, uh, before His crucifixion, He was worried about that. He was struggling. He knew what was about to happen. The flesh was warring against the Spirit. What I liked was because of the command from the Father, the same way I talked about Bezalel and Saul and then David and all the other prophets, he has authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. Where did that authority come from? It comes from God the Father. Where does the authority we have come from to do the things we're supposed to do that God lays out in advance for us to do? From the Father. 
from the Father. Their wills are in sync. Our wills are to be in sync. Again, I hope that makes sense to you. They took Jesus to the high priest and the chief priest and the elders and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. I love the fact that they weren't having a trial to determine truth. They were having a trial to find evidence to prove whatever it is that they already wanted. The sentence was determined before the trial began. Put him to death. The problem was they couldn't find anybody to make their statements agree. Then some stood up and gave false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands and in three days build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony didn't agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. See, Jesus has no reason to answer here. These men can't agree on what they're saying. There is absolutely no reason for Jesus to weigh into the conversation. The high priest is wanting him to say something, so maybe they'll trip him up with some words that he says. You're going to find in the next verses that he does that very thing, but he does it on purpose for a totally different reason. But Jesus is simply not going to engage in this conversation. It is of no value to him, and he does not care. If they can't bring charges that will stick to him, why does he need to defend himself? But now, look what happens next. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am said Jesus. Now a lot of people, I've heard a lot of lessons that said this is the point at which Jesus is declaring that He is actually God Almighty. Uh, And I know that God says in in the Old Testament that I know, uh, uh, Moses says, how do I tell people who you are? Tell them the I Am sent you. Well, yeah, there's a vague reference to that right here. And Jesus does say the word I Am, but I don't think the high priest would have said, oh, He's calling Himself God at that point. But hold on. I think what Jesus is saying right there, Jesus is saying, you asked me a question. Are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of the Blessed One. And then He punctuates it. He says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now this is a big deal. This is a direct quotation from two very dominant messianic prophecies. One is Daniel chapter 7 and the other one is Psalm 110. Let's look at those. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel says, In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man. We've heard this before. Jesus has referenced this Daniel passage multiple times as he's describing himself as the son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days, that's God Almighty, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed." Do you see what this passage is saying? This is a passage talking about the Son of Man who is the Messiah coming with the clouds of heaven and approaching God Almighty and being given authority and glory and sovereign power by that Lord God Almighty. All right. Then Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. We saw Jesus reference this in talking uh, to the scribes and Pharisees not long before. Until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. And then see what that means to sit at the right hand. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you like dew 
from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change His mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of His wrath. Do you hear that? That is the second coming. That is the messianic prophecy about the end of the age and the age to come. We've talked about that with the rich young, ah, rich young ruler. Jesus has just said, I am the Son of Man. I am coming in glory on the clouds. I am going to sit at the right hand. Sit at the right hand of the Lord God Almighty. Now let's see how they reacted to that. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fist, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. See, now they had all they needed. Jesus had declared, plenty of people had demonstrated that they thought He was going to be the King, the Messiah. Now Jesus Himself had said He was going to be the Messiah, but the way He said it, He said it in a way that said, I am not only just one coming to reestablish the kingdom, I'm one that is equivalent to God Almighty. And that, is blasphemous. You see, Pilate was going was to gonna care a lot about the fact that there's this guy claiming to be king because Rome doesn't like other people claiming to be king. That's only Caesar or someone that they set up like Herod. But the people, the people are going to worry about blasphemy. They don't want their king to be a blasphemous king. So now, they have both someone that they can present to Pilate and he will be condemned and someone they can present to the people and they will be condemned. And now let's look at how the passage ends. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you're one of them, for you're a Galilean. He, be, he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know this man. I don't know who you're talking about. He said, he, he punctuated it with curses. Man, we ought to understand that today because we live in a society that most people can't hardly say hello without using a four-letter word. We punctuate everything. Hopefully not we, but... Our society punctuates everything with curses. We emphasize things with curses. And that's how Peter tried to say, it's not somebody I know. I'm not part of him. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. John tells us that Jesus was walking across the courtyard, being taken across the courtyard by the soldiers as they were taking him to Pilate. And he looks to Peter as Peter is denying him as the rooster is crowing. Talk about a poignant situation. Talk about everything Jesus had ever said to Peter. Talk about everything Peter had ever said to Jesus coming back before him, flashing before his eyes. I can't even imagine the sense of distraught that Peter would have had. Yes, he did break down and weep. I want to close asking you this question. Do you ever deny Jesus? Sad to say I do. I don't think I've ever denied him verbally. 
I don't think anyone's ever asked me whether I was a, a follower of Jesus and I said no. But you know, I'm sure there are many, many times when I had an opportunity to declare my allegiance to Jesus and I didn't use it. I didn't take it. One of my prayers is like the prayer Paul leads in Ephesians chapter 6 when he says, Pray that I will be bold, that the Lord will put the words in my mouth, that I will be bold in declaring Jesus. I want to be bold. I want to be bold. I don't want to be, I I like being bold. I want to be bold in front of you guys, but you guys are my friends. You guys and I agree with each other. We know who Jesus is. I want to be bold to people who don't know who Jesus is. I want to be bold to people even worse than that. I want to be bold to people who know who He is and don't like Him. I want the Lord to put words in my mouth so that I can do that. Do you deny Jesus? I pray that all of us will not. Have a great week. Next week, we will go into the crucifixion, the trial before Pilate and the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have a great week. God bless you.